Welcome to Nuanced Beauty, because the world is nuanced and we think that's beautiful. Hi guys, welcome back to Nuanced Beauty. Uh, Today I am bringing another interview uh, with a gal named Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer is a mom and she has two boys. She is a lover of beaches and in her professional life, she is a coach with Optavia. Uh, She found herself pursuing this passion after losing 40 pounds during the pandemic and breaking free from food addiction. Optavia uh, offered her some amazing curriculum, and it really reshaped her mindset around food and healthy eating. And why are we doing this episode? So now that we are a month into the new year, this tends to be the time when I feel like most resolutions fall by the wayside for people and old habits that we may not love about ourselves start to really sink back in. Uh, So I wanted to do this episode with her. as a sort of encouragement to the audience to keep on keeping on. I imagine that other people are also worried about uh, maintaining a healthy weight or just a healthy lifestyle. And this might be on your list as well. I know it's on mine. And as someone who has lost the weight and kept it off for many years now, I thought we could have an interesting conversation. So with that, uh, welcome, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's dive right into the first question. Uh, well, I guess before we do that, um, is there anything you'd like to add to that introduction to help the audience get to know you a little better? Well, I love how you said that there might be some people out there really wanting to reshape some old habits. And so as we talk today, I just want our listeners to know that it's not about the number on the scale being skinny. It's Mm. about the number on the scale being healthy. And that's really the focus. And as we talk, there's no judgment around the number or how someone's feeling. It's really about finding freedom within your own health Mm -hmm. and what that looks like. Yeah, I I really enjoy that point because I I I've been through seasons where uh, the number on the scale is going to dictate my personality for the day, Aww. or it's going to make me feel like I'm good or I'm bad, right? Because right. we just overemphasize that number, and like it's a valuable stat, and it does indicate some things, and it correlates with some health issues. I agree, but it's not everything. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, let's dive into the first question I had for you is, um, so many things in life I feel can overwhelm us and we can end up in a spot where we really feel stuck in old habits. Um, is there a time that you could maybe share with the audience where you were in an overwhelming moment in your health journey? Hmm. I love how you call it a health journey because that's really what it is. It's not one day in time or even one month in time. It's been a journey and how I have focused on my health. Um, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s where the focus were supermodels and supermodels skinny was beautiful. Oh, yes. And that was the image that was portrayed. That was the like milestone. Yeah. Yeah to be held up to. Right. And so there was a bar that my body wasn't going to fit, I felt. And so then I felt that I didn't measure up in a way. Mm. And somehow that became the way I saw health was my own physical appearance. And if it was small enough and worthy enough to what these models were looking like. Um, And then what happened is in the 90s, we um, had the highest um, epidemic of obesity start in America that we'd ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And so now we have this unbalanced, right? Like skinny is beautiful in our society, but at the same time, like we're becoming this obese society. And so what's happening in all this unbalanced? And so I was feeling very overwhelmed. I couldn't get my mind around it, which is right. And the other thing is I felt like we don't know how to treat food. So when somebody is let's say when you were younger and you would come home with straight A's on your report card, what would you do? You would get to pick your favorite meal or go out to a dinner to celebrate. And so food Uh, was being used as a celebration. Uh Or if you came home from school sad, um, you know, what would your mom... with my boyfriend. Let's go have some ice cream. Ice cream, right, (laughs) uh, right. And or eat it out of the carton on the kitchen counter together, right? (laughs) And so food was a celebration and food was used as medicine to heal in a sense of Mm -hmm. our emotions. And so there's this whole unbalanced again of what is food and how do we use it? And Uh so in my journey, I was struggling. I really wasn't sure what food looked like or what the meaning of food was really supposed to be. Um, So yeah, there was a lot of overwhelming feelings on how to 
make this, I could see that it was unbalanced. I just couldn't figure out how to balance it in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, is there anything that helped you, um, progress and get past some of these moments? Yeah. Um, I learned some calming sayings that I just will say quietly to myself in my head. Um, things like I don't live with scarcity around food, you know, in in America, there's always food around. Um, so there'll be chocolate cake tonight and there'll be chocolate cake next month. And there was chocolate cake last month and it's not going anywhere. And, um, I can partake in that chocolate cake if I choose to, but I don't Mm -hmm. have to do it all the time because it's not going anywhere. And so just to remind myself, this is not my last meal, um, Uh has been helpful. And then also, um, telling myself, you know, I'm an emotional eater sometimes. And so asking myself, does this food fix the problem. I think often when you're an emotional eater, you run to food because it'll give you a quick, especially if you're having sugar dopamine reaction and you might have, there's an actual chemical physical reaction to food. Yes, there absolutely is. And we need to acknowledge that. And so for a hot minute, you know, it might make you feel better, but really it doesn't fix the problem. It doesn't fix the emotion. And Mm so, um, I'll pause now. And when I'm having those kinds of feelings and ask myself, does this food fix the problem? And almost always the answer is no. Uh And does this food get me closer to my goal? Uh And so kind of just stopping in the chaos and asking myself some calming questions like that, that I can truthfully answer have helped in those moments. I like that. It kind of reminds me just on the topic of addiction, uh, totally unrelated topic, but addiction specifically, um, someone had given Bill and I great advice about, um, uh, you don't have to do that thing Ah. because when you're really spinning out of control and you feel like you actually don't have a choice, but you actually do have a choice. Yes. And I think like you said, with the chocolate cake example, like you can choose to partake today. Um, or you could choose not to, You don't have to eat it and you don't have to feel like it's your last meal, every meal. And, um, that's, that's a really good point. And I think if you choose to eat it on that day, you need to eat it in freedom with no guilt. Yes. Yeah. And so where's the balance on that? Mm -hmm. Right. And those are some mindset things that I've learned and, um, that we, you know, we'll talk about as we, as we talk today, but I think those are important for people to really understand the difference. You know, we don't have to do anything just because it's somebody's birthday and they're serving cake as, because we're now we're using cake as the example, Uh you don't have to eat that cake. Right. Uh But you can choose to. Uh Uh-huh. Um, and that, yeah, we, we kind of, we wrestle with that in our house too, because, uh, when we are out, like if we go out to eat or if, if in a, in the instance of like a birthday or celebration, we do typically partake in the food because we kind of weigh it against the relationship because we view food as very vulnerable and intimate to share a meal with someone. So, um, we can eat in freedom, um, with this group and not necessarily go into this like gluttonous spiral or be trapped in the food. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's a lot there. There is. Um, Okay. So I think, uh, educating ourselves can be a key driver to help, uh, help us make lasting changes. Uh, but I also think that in the information era that we are in, there are endless programs out there to try when it comes to finding a healthy life or just, you know, a way of doing things differently. Um, so I'm curious, before you found Optavia, did you try other programs and uh, what were the highs and lows for you? Oh, yeah. I was a professional dieter, right? I was out there doing all the diets all the time. Um, it was really exhausting. I'll be real truthful on that. Uh-huh. Um, you know, some things I tried, Weight Watchers, Keto, Nutrisystem, Intermittent Fasting, Atkins, Slim Fast Shakes, South Beach Diet. And the highs on some of them were I did lose the weight. I did hit my, my goal weight on some of those programs. Mm -hmm. The lows on, on some of those programs were they were very, um, calorie deficit or they didn't feel sustainable that I could do that Mm -hmm. forever. And on all of those, I saw a finish line that when I hit the goal, I was done. (laughs) 
I checked out. <laughs> moving on. Yeah. And really, <laughs> I'm not sustainable. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes I think hitting the healthy goal is just the beginning of the journey. Uh-huh. Um, and what I have come to realize is that diets don't work. And in fact, research mm-hmm. tells us that 80% of the people who lose weight with only a diet mentality, not changing their mindset around food, but just mm-hmm. doing the diet mentality, like, mm-hmm. 80% of the people gain the weight back in within two years. Wow. Yeah. That's a high stat. But I, I, it kind of makes sense like that there's beauty in educating yourself Mm. and looking outside of you for information. Yes. But how are you internalizing and how are you changing your own heart or motivations in the, in the meantime? Like, is it just a list of rules that somebody told you to do and you're just, you're just blindly following those rules or are you making, yeah, those long-term changes? Yeah. And and a long-term change is what a habit really is. I mean, I don't think anyone has had to remind me to brush my teeth since I was about five years old, right? Uh It just became a habit. It Mm -hmm. was expected that I brushed my teeth in the morning. It was expected I brushed my teeth before bedtime. I had an adult in my life that helped model that and remind me of that until it became a habit. But now it's just a natural thing I do. Uh And so when we're on these quote unquote diets, what are the natural things that we really are turning into habits Mm -hmm. so that we're not thinking about them? They're second nature. They're just part of who we are. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, You kind of mentioned like the idea of sustainable in some of the programs that you've tried. uh, But did you ever feel like you struggled with that yo-yo dieting? Oh, yes. Until I found Optavia, I felt like I struggled with dieting since the age of 12. I would lose weight. I would gain it back. I would lose weight. I would gain it back. And so Mm. there was the yo-yo, right? And um, when I learned more about entering a a program that's only about food and not about changing your mind, that's when I really realized that the statistic about diets not working is so true. Uh Um, So if our listeners are listening and their resolutions are already in the rearview mirror, they are not alone. Um, In fact, the second Friday of January, every new year is called Quitter's Day. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's really early. We're already past that. We are. Aren't we? That would have been last Friday for when we're recording. Mm -hmm. We're past Quitter's Day. Okay. Um, And so that's the time that they find most people have already given up on their resolutions or interestingly enough, they've already forgotten about them. Oh, okay. Right. Uh So you, it, it, it's, they want to make changes and it's just not sustainable or they haven't written it out for themselves or maybe didn't make it it a high, like enough high resolution or such. Like we, we did a a new year's resolution episode and all about change because I know a gal who's a life coach and it came out before the new year, but we talked about like kind of having this um, high definition and having micro milestones Mm -hmm. and celebrating as you win to make it measurable, achievable, you know, all that fun jazz. Oh yeah. And measurable is a key word, right? Uh Because if you're going to say, I'm going to lose weight this year, but there's no plan. And then how do you measure that? Uh Right. I mean, the scale, obviously, but other things that come with that. So Uh I love that measurable part. But it does, I guess, like with the yo-yoing, what comes up for me is um, like I personally do have a tendency to be like a type A all in or all out. Like if I don't see it as achievable, I'm out. Like I'm good. Ah. I'm not going to waste my time on that. So when that, how does that play out with eating? Like in my own journey, it's like there have been times of of those more like rule driven, like focused or my, my workout routine. I'm all in, I'm scheduled and I have a high visibility like plan. But when like kids get sick for a couple Uh, days and I get like knocked back, I really get knocked back because I was like, oh, no, but I had this achievable, you know, measurable. And then I didn't get the achievement in the measurement that I planned. And it, yeah, it takes a toll. (laughs) It does. And I think we have to give ourselves grace, Mm -hmm. right? And um, I I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head with the example of, you know, going to the gym or working out, but then you have kids that get sick. And so your priority becomes your children as it should. And then you Uh miss a few days. And Uh I'm very A-type as well. And um, so I... I have a lot of empathy and relatability to that comment that you made because I remember that for so many years, just feeling like that. Uh huh. I guess that that does tie in. uh, The next question I had for you is, uh, do you recall setting ambitious goals and uh, that weren't really sustainable? Yeah, um, I 
I personally used to go to the gym at 530 in the morning. Okay. Um, and for me, it was an all or nothing mindset. Similar. Okay. Yeah. Very similar with what you just shared. So um, if I missed a day because my husband was traveling and so nobody was at home to be with the children at 530 in the morning or a mm -hmm. child was sick, or even if I were sick, then I felt like I had ruined the week, so to speak. And then this mindset of, oh, I'll start again on Monday starts to creep in, right? Which is such a silly mindset because if it's <laughs> Thursday. It's like, I'll start on, I'll start on Monday. Yeah, I'll start tomorrow. Exactly. <laughs> and then tomorrow comes. I'll start tomorrow. <laughs> yes. And yeah. Um, so I kind of have a funny story, but it's so true. And I share it with my clients. If you woke up and went out to your car in the morning and somebody had slashed a tire, the sensible thing, if you told somebody about it would be, yeah. And you know, I was disappointed that happened, but I went and I had it repaired or I had it patched or, you know, replaced whatever had to happen. And you got on with your day. And I drove my car. Yes. Yeah. But if you shared with your friend, yeah, I woke up and somebody had slashed a tire. So I just went out there with a knife and slashed the other three. <laughs> That would be a ridiculous response. Uh -huh. And the person you're sharing this with would think you were crazy, right? right. But how the metaphor is so, so eerily similar. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. So when we say, I had to get over the, the all or nothing and really reframe that to progress, not perfection. Mm, uh -huh. So if the measurable goal is to work out five out of seven days this week for, mm -hmm. you know, the example we've both spoken on on the gym great. And if that yeah. happens, yay. But if you only get there three days out of the five, because life happened, it gets, mm -hmm. you know, stuff happens in the messy, right? Yeah. So you still got there three days and we need to give ourselves grace and give praise to ourselves, And that's progress. Yeah. There were still three days. Like how about you focus on the three days and not the fact that you missed two. That's exactly <laughs> right. I got that. Yeah. yeah. Or if you were able to go Monday and you missed Tuesday and Wednesday, the fact that you got back and went Thursday and Friday versus uh, just throwing caution to the wind. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a great point. It, it resonates. Uh, in December, I went ahead and I tried uh, almost every gym. I'm like, well, I, there's plenty of gyms, but basically within a five mile radius, I okay. went and I did the free classes. Yeah. Because my intent was to kind of um, discover, like, okay, does this genuinely fit into our finances, our schedule, and our family? Because I have a little one not in school yet. So, how's the childcare at this spot? And I was trying to kind of create that high high like uh, definition picture that this is uh, sustainable, but I was also taking it like a day at a time to the point where now if I'm looking at joining a gym long term, I feel kind of funny about it. I almost want to pay as I go because okay. I want the day to count for the day and not get caught in like the, the negative part of like, oh, I have a monthly membership. I only went twice this month and like, you know, yeah. and kind of allow that to um, muddy my vision. But it's it's a work in progress. I, I'm still I have a couple gyms and I have one in mind that I, I might sign up for six months. But now I'm in this spot where I, I spent December and early January really trying to just be like, OK, I went today. I tried a new gym today. I checked it out. I considered if I liked it and like checkbox for today. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So huh, it's a work in progress. Well, it me. sounds like you're giving yourself some grace and I'm thankful to hear that. Um, mm -hmm. That's, and I think you're doing a great job. And also remember, we don't have to go to a gym to get a workout in, right? right. There are other things we can do. And those are some of the habits that I talk to, to my clients about. It doesn't mean that you've had to suit up with your yoga pants on or your workout shirt and your tennis shoes. There's uh -huh. other ways to get healthy motion in on busy days. Right. Yeah. House cleaning for two hours is actually. <laughs> sure. Yeah. It's a legit workout. Sure. <laughs> Picking the parking spot at Target or Publix at the furthest, furthest parking yeah. spot and getting extra steps in. These are all I like like that. little changes that add up to a big result. Uh-huh. Um, okay. Next question I wanted to ask you is, uh, about accountability. Um, what role has accountability played in your health journey? Oh, it's been huge. Um, so with Optavia, they provide a coach and a curriculum to every client. And so my coach was my accountability partner in the journey. Oh, okay. Um, the first week of the program, the coach walks with me 
um, every day during my journey to make sure I understand the program, ask how things are going. Um, we operate in a fat burning program for most clients. So, you know, okay. are you in fat burn yet? How do you know? How are you feeling? Okay. Things like that. And then and weekly- just for the audience, like fat burning would mean like the level of intensity. You're not at like a high interval hit style but you're, and you're not like just lightly breathing. Oh, great question. Right? It's kind right. of that middle spot. So actually the fat burn that I'm talking about is a natural fat burn that happens um, based on the protein and carbs that you're eating. Oh, okay. So our bodies okay. naturally burn glycogen. Mm -hmm. And um, when we remove some glycogen, which are carbs from mm -hmm. our bodies, and we are focused more on protein, still eating carbs. I Yeah, not going full no. keto. Yeah, but I mean, I ate 100... 80 to 100 carbs probably every day. So, I mean, we are eating carbs, uh -huh. but um, it allows our body to burn our fat mm -hmm. and it preserves our muscle mass. Mm -hmm. And when we're burning fat, we can sustain um, feeling full longer uh -huh. um, and we have more energy. We sleep better. So when I was um, talking about fat burn, that's what I'm referring to. But okay. great question. You can be in a fat burn you know, yeah, the there's a thing also. about your heart rate right, or it's your cardio, exactly. cardio or, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then also the other part of accountability outside of my coach was the curriculum because the curriculum is really where the habit changes came and where the mindset changes came. When I talked about like progress over perfection, um, mm -hmm. learning to prioritize my sleep, hydration. I mean, you almost never find me without a water bottle now because that's just a natural habit that has been created. Um, getting rid of some screen time in my life, okay. finding out how to have healthy motion. Uh -huh. yeah. um, I, I was hoping to start to jump into Optavia and obviously the accountability sounds like a big part of the company, uh, but I, I had never heard of the program before. And um, like, I wanted to ask you, what do you think sets this program apart in the health and wellness world? And Definitely sounds like accountability, but do you want to expand on that? Yeah, sure. So a little bit about Optivia it's, itself is um, it is a company that does offer clinically proven plans um, and scientifically developed products, which we refer to as fuelings. Okay. Um, um, plus uh, habits of health curriculum. So that's kind okay. of what the Optivia plan is. Okay. Um, and then like I mentioned, every client gets a coach and the curriculum um, and they work through that together while they're on their weight loss journey. Okay. But um, we also believe that, and I kind of referred to this before, but that the healthy weight, so your goal weight is uh -huh. your starting point. And so what does living your life to the best level or optimizing your life look like? forever. Okay. And a lot of people might refer to that um, area of your life as maintenance once you've hit your goal weight, mm. but what have you done to change and what are you going to do to maintain this healthy lifestyle? Okay. Um, and the founder and director of the Johns Hopkins Weight Management Center advises with Optavia and our board. Um, okay. And he believes that we must have um, a way to move towards health before there's actually a chronic problem. Okay. Right. So by the time somebody shows up in the ER, to the with point the of heart, having a chronic issue, like yes. that's too late. Like we need to, we need to catch them young. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so having somebody from the medical field like that really sitting on our board and helping with decisions that are made, but we're really about people taking their health in their own hands before it's too late. Okay. Right? Before um, type two diabetes is is developed. You know, yeah, exactly. Swing. Before heart issue, before high cholesterol. And some of these things we know are genetic, but some of these, th a lot of these things can be helped yeah. and controlled through someone's weight, which yeah. is where we get to the healthy part. And that's the whole idea of, um, I'm sure you, epigenetics. It's, yes. It's the idea of like, yeah, you have genes, but the gene expression is highly influenced by the environment that you're in and the things that are, you're bringing into your body. Yes. And you just can't like, we, I think we've, uh, underestimated that component of our health for quite some time. And I, I love how it's becoming a more common speak, but this idea of like, well, it's just, you know, it's in my genetics, but it's like, but what if it was actually just your household's environment? And then you mm. continued that environment into your life. And so is that, you know, is that potentially a crutch to justify our situation a little too much. That's where, that's where I struggle with that one. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've certainly heard that from people, from clients, right? Yeah, it's and just my whole family. <laughs> it's like, well, you all ate the same food. So your your gut health is the same. <laughs> and, right. And it is yeah. true. Genetics do play into it. So uh -huh. in this conversation, we're certainly not downplaying that. But yeah. you are right. We can make decisions that are different from what everybody else in our family did to yeah. help our health. Yeah. Right. To help prevent those things. And I will tell you, there have been plenty of people that I've worked with who signed up with Optavia and they only wanted to do the food part. Oh, and guess okay. what? That became a diet. Uh-huh. And is that even an option? Like, can you do the program with compartment? Or are they kind of like, no, it's no, the we, it's all, all the components of the program oh, good. is what we coach. Okay. Um, could you go off and do it on your own and never talk to your coach and not ever do the curriculum and just do the food part? Uh -huh. Sure. I mean, you know, who, yes, you could. Uh -huh. However, the success rate of keeping that weight off and really making those life changes it's it, not, it, it's not as good. No, you're going to fall in the 20% category. And those, the, remember I shared 80% of people who go with the diet mentality, gain the weight back within two years. Uh -huh. We can hope you're going to be the 20% that keeps it off if you're in a diet mentality, uh -huh. but there's more success when you're walking along someone, when you're changing your habits, when you have an accountability partner, when you have a curriculum to teach you about health. Yeah. Um, so all of those things, it's been life changing for me. And um, kind of with that and your story specifically, the timeline, um, talk to me a little more about when you were first introduced to Optavia, that was during COVID times. It was. What did the timeline and your journey sort of look like? Was it like, was this like six months of close accountability? Was this a month? Was it like, kind of explore that for me? Yeah, great question. So I also had never heard of Optavia until I heard about it. You know what I mean? So uh -huh. um, I heard about it during the pandemic. Um, it was new to me and I went into it um, kind of with a bad attitude. And I'll explain that in a second. But also remember, I have a very A-type personality as well. So that all I, in or right. I'm out. <laughs> so I went all in with uh -huh. everything I was told to do. Uh -huh. But I told my coach, I'm going to do it for one month and you're going to see it doesn't work. Okay. Like I don't have success losing weight on things very easily. Okay. And in the first month I lost 13 pounds. Wow. Yeah. And so that was motivating. And then it took me four months and one week to lose 40 pounds. Okay. So, um, John Hopkins and the study with research, we've come back to say a woman on the five and one plan, which we have a few different plans, but that's the one I did. will lose an average of eight to 12 pounds a month, month over Tell month. Me what five and one. So that's one five of our plans and one so or something. Five plus one is six. six so, yeah. um, eating six times a day oh, with okay. low glycemic, higher protein, oh, um, okay. foods. And then, um, we have other programs, one's called the four and two, but again, four plus two is six. So yes. still eating six times a day. Uh -huh. And these things help balance our blood sugar. They keep our metabolism revved. Okay. Um, and they make you where you're not starving all day long because you're eating every two to three hours. Uh -huh. um, so that's just a little bit like little in the bit. nutshell. But then at, when you asked how much I was with my coach, yeah. weekly check-in calls, if I needed more than that, text away, letting her know, you know, if I was having a temptation, if I was struggling with something. Okay. Um, but in those calls, we weren't, they weren't like weigh in calls. I mean, if you, if I wanted to share my weight, I could, but it was more of what did I learn this week on the chapter that I read? How okay. am I internalizing this? What habit am I working on? And we're big about focusing on one habit at a time because mm -hmm. you can't implement seven habits at one time. Uh -huh. I, I mean, I guess you could, but it'd be very difficult. Just like we talked about people have already forgotten their new year's resolution in two weeks to two months, you know? Uh -huh. Um, so what are we focusing on? And it was those little, we call them micro habits, but those little changes that I was making that add up to a big result. Okay. Right. Learning how to prepare a low glycemic um, meal. What mm -hmm. does that look like? And not be in the kitchen all day. Uh-huh. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Like, because I need something that's sustainable. I'm a mom, I'm raising children. I have a working husband who, you know, like we try to have family dinners or we're going out together and what can I eat and not feel like I'm missing out. Yeah. But I'm, a, I'm still with the people around the table enjoying it and I'm still uh -huh. getting to enjoy my food. Nourish and yeah, yeah. here. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And then, so it sounds like just the, the weekly check-ins and you said around four or five months, you would kind of hit your goal weight and then did you continued with the coach? Do you still know them today or? Yeah. So, um, 
I, after I lost my weight, and again, I lost it during the pandemic. So people weren't going out and you weren't seeing people as much. Right. Uh And then all of a sudden people started seeing me. And it was like, whoa, what are you doing? Like, what happened? You look great. Because a lot of people during the pandemic did the opposite of me. Uh They put on weight, (laughs) right? Uh Um, So, and I had so much freedom around food, which is something that really came as a gift. I mean, it wasn't something I was expecting. It just came through the program. But I really wanted to stand on my roof and like shout it to everybody. Uh So I um, decided to become a coach through the program. So I became a certified coach and um, I was able to help my friends and then other clients as well. But in terms of my coach, once I hit my goal weight, I went into four um, weeks of transition where I reintroduced all food groups and I learned how to balance those things um, with low glycemic. And I still am in touch with my coach today. So what motivates you today to keep prioritizing? Reminding myself of how far I've come, that I never want to go back to that. Um, I've shared, I found food freedom through the program and it really is an awesome feeling. And so if I'm focusing on myself and being selfish for just a few seconds, that's what we kind of have to do when we're taking care of us. Right. And sometimes Uh we miss that in the self care, Mm -hmm. but knowing how far I've come and how good I feel is definitely motivating not to go back to my old ways. Uh Um, And also knowing that it was little changes that added up to this big result. It didn't happen overnight. And so continuing to implementing, implementing the changes that I already have made and then even adding Mm -hmm. other things to come to even a better spot in life. Uh Um, I remember the days of going into my closet and just standing there and thinking, what am I going to wear today? And then when I would grab something to put it on and it didn't fit, just feeling so disgusted and discouraged. And now there's just a lot of freedom to know I can go in and get dressed in the morning. And again, this is talking about self-care for a minute. Yeah, Um, That's part of self-care, right? Like knowing that you've you've taken care of your body so that you can fit into your clothes and that you feel good and you can go out and you can make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's something that motivates me. I like that. Um, And also knowing that um, I need, and we talked about this a little bit, but small measurable goals because we're never done with our journey. Yeah. Right. So Uh even though the scale reflects a healthy weight for me, Mm -hmm. um, I could still be better in a lot of other areas. And Uh so what can I do to make myself even 1% better today than yesterday? Mm -hmm. And if we lived like that, we would be what, 366% better this year with leap day in there? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it Um, is a leap year. Yeah. Yeah. Just to get a little Uh bit better every day. Um, And I think that moves us forward in our health also. Right. Like it's, it's finding purpose in each day and continuing to find purpose. And yeah, and that's, that's really good. Yeah. Um, given where you are at and kind of having hindsight 2020 to be able to look back on your journey, um, what would you tell the you from years ago when you were really struggling and you were in the middle of that overwhelmed season? Um, what would you tell you to find a sense of peace around your health? Oh, I love the word peace and the phrase sense of peace. Um, I want everyone listening today to be reminded that they are wonderfully and fearfully made. And whether they're struggling with weight or they're struggling somewhere else in their life, they're enough just as they are today. Mm -hmm. And um, when I work with my clients, I hear a lot of sadness and frustration and discouragement. And it's, it shouldn't be like that. Like we're enough. And so people need to know that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really wish that somebody had told the old girl, you know, when you ask like <laughs> hindsight's twenty twenty, and what would I tell that girl? I wish that somebody or there was a voice in her saying, you're enough. Mm-hmm. Um, that was something I needed to hear. Mm-hmm. Um, even though the number and my own personal health was not where I wanted it to be, I was enough right yeah. where I was that day. Um, but that said, I would also tell that girl from years ago, there's hope and there's healing and it's coming your way. And girl, when you hear about Optavia, you ask the questions and you do the work because it's going to change your life. I love that. Yeah. Um, I, we're kind of coming down to the wire. Um, 
So we uh, like to do book recommendations. Um, People who have tuned in more recently, they may not know, but uh, we were doing a book rec every episode because it's kind of one of the ways that we view as a way to dive deeper and get nuanced on a topic. You read a book, you learn way more and, you know, you can't make these quick quick snap, you know, conclusions with a book. So we uh, used to do book recs all the time and sometimes I add them into an interview you sometime I forget today I remembered <laughs> okay so um Jennifer is there any books that you have read and you feel like they really um encouraged you and they would apply to this topic yeah so um two come to mind one is called the habits of health and it's by Dr. Wayne Scott Anderson okay. and it is part of the Optavia curriculum actually but the book is readily available to anyone okay. um and it talks about healthy habits. So I've mentioned a lot of things, but I haven't um, given a ton of details. But like I said, it'll go into an entire chapter on why hydration is important, how you can implement that in your life, the benefits that you'll see, why the plate size that you choose is important, oh, um, yeah. uh-huh. how that can change. So a lot of uh, meaning behind the madness, so to speak. Uh-huh. Um, but then how do we, once we learn these habits, how do we apply them? And one of the best books I've read in terms of habit, habits is Atomic Habits by James Clear. Atomic Habits. Okay. Um, and he will really like, so I'll tell you one little thing he does. He calls it habit stacking. Oh, um, okay. Yes. I think I've heard that so, term, but I haven't read this book. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you want to start doing push-ups every day and that's a habit. You just, you want it to be a natural thing, right? Uh-huh. So when you turn your water on in your shower in the morning, as soon as the water turns on and you're waiting for it to get hot, you drop and you do 20 push-ups. Oh, right? okay. Yeah. And if you can't do 20, you start with five. <laughs> and if you can do more than 20, then you do 40. But it's just something oh that you gosh. add in every day. Or uh-huh. if you're a coffee drinker. And you find something that triggers. So real yes. quick on the push-up thing. Uh-huh. I saw a um, Instagram reel. The husband sent it to me. And it was a mom walking around her house. And whenever she heard mom, <laughs> she dropped and did a push-up. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's terrible. <laughs> well, that could be a way to habit stack, right? Because uh-huh. you'll hear the word mom. mom. And- <laughs> Drop and give me a push up. Yeah. Um, another- and not the kid, but maybe it should have been the other way around. Oh, like make the yeah, kid yeah, drop yeah. and do the push up yes, for saying exactly. mom. Exactly. <laughs> maybe he, they would stop saying it. <laughs> mom. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I, I love this one too. People will say, oh, I want to read a book, which we were talking about book recommendations, but I don't have time or I forget. Uh-huh. Well, what if you put your book right by your coffee pot? And every morning when you go to turn it on or start the brewing or put the Uh K cup in, you are committed to reading two pages. Yeah. Right. It's a micro amount of time, but I mean, you're standing there. That's Uh right. And it becomes a habit. Uh Um, And so these are just, this is what he calls habit stacking. So like, for instance, turning on the shower is something you do mindlessly, right? Uh Putting the push up in with it becomes a habit. Uh Brewing the coffee. If you're a coffee drinker is something you do every day. It's a habit. Yeah putting the book with it is something you've stacked. Uh-huh. So um, those are two books that I would Clever. recommend. Wonderful. Um, and then uh, before we wrap up, uh, how can people connect with you if they uh, wanted to reach out about Optavia? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I have a Linktree page. So it's Linktree backslash Jennifer Sicilian, which is my name. Okay. Um, and there they can get more information about my story. They can find there's direct contact information to me. And also there's a wellness survey there. Okay. So people can fill that out and it kind of um, lets them rate different areas of their life on a scale of how they're feeling. And, um, it could be about their workload, their stress, their sleep, their Mm -hmm. hydration, what they're eating. Um, and that survey does come to me. Um, and it's another way I can connect with people who are looking to change some of their habits. Okay. I like that. I like the idea of the Q and a there because, uh, just, just for the simplicity of, uh, reflecting, yeah. on the things that you do mindlessly or the things that you are not paying attention to, <laughs> you know, exactly. I, I like that. Um, and I will definitely put in the show notes, um, the link tree for anyone listening, scroll down and you can uh, find, find her way to connect. Um, Jennifer, it's been lovely chatting with you today. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. I've loved our conversation and, um, I really do think that it goes into the the whole name of your podcast, right? Like finding the beauty in the crazy of health. <laughs> 
because it's something it's, that we're going to deal with every day of our life, our health. And yeah. uh, this is the only body we're getting, but we've got to find beauty within that uh -huh, to keep moving. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Well, with that, thanks guys. Thanks for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And in the spirit of nuance, I hope you found something that you could agree with and you could disagree with and still choose to lean in. Give us a follow rating and review and consider sharing this episode with a friend to continue the dialogue and help us grow. Until next time.